This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Tim Rosenberg. And we're happy to have back on the show this week. I don't, oh God, it must, we must be approaching a dozen times, Drew, I think. Is it I like don't. a subway card where you get punched, you know, you get your 12? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. You get one free show after that. <laughs> well, I was going to say you get a free sub. That's a better deal, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, Drew is a uh, blogger and orchestra business consultant. He's come on the show to give us the rundown on the orchestra business and what we might be expecting in future seasons. Um, we're happy you can be back on the show today. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for having me. So uh, we've been talking all season long, all orchestra season long, I should say, and we're kind of at, at the end of it now about a lot of different labor disputes. And one of the places that we always look to for our, our news and commentary and analysis is, is your blog, Adaptation. Um, and I was wondering, we were just talking before we started rolling, that there's not been a lot of new news uh, about the Minnesota orchestra situation. So uh, for, for anybody that hasn't been following what's going on in Minnesota, uh, could you maybe give a, a, a brief synopsis and explain what the situation is right now? Sure. Have they've gone through an entire season of being dark, meaning no concert event performances. It's been a lockout situation since September. Uh, and they're at that point right now at the beginning of the summer season where orchestras, even a 52-week orchestra, um, scale back on their uh, event-related services just a bit. It's usually kind of the quieter time of the season. Um, so everybody's really just in wait mode to see what's going to happen uh, in September as to whether or not the lockout will continue. The music director, Osmo Vanska, has drawn a line in the sand with when the orchestra needs to get back to work or he will resign, and that is also in September. So it's it's a lot of hurry up and wait at this point. Well, do you think do you think that uh, with Osmo Vanska? I mean, is that a do you think it really is much an ultimatum as it sounds, or um, is it just you know, hey guys, let's get our stuff together? I think it's both. Uh, I think it's certainly meant to inspire all parties to try to reach an agreement, but I I don't think he's bluffing at all. Um, from a career standpoint, it's better for him to craft the exit language for his position rather than have that decided for him. It's clear where his artistic threshold of excellence stands uh, so that there's no misinterpretation, I'd say, about where he is on that. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the artistic threshold of excellence because that's something that we've continued to talk about when these orchestras um, are not playing for a long period of time, inevitably, the players go elsewhere, um, and Minnesota Orchestra has certainly lost some some really important players, uh, and they just had a concert on Friday, kind of bidding farewell to some of the the key players that are leaving, um, and I I wonder if that's if that's something that you think we're going to continue to see o over the summer, and and how many people are going to stick around. Uh, even until that September deadline that Vanska has given or, or past that if he leaves? I would be surprised if, if any musician is going to stick around on the hope that things will resolve amicably or in a situation that will be mutually satisfactory uh, in a personal level. Uh, most musicians are going to be in a position to where they're going to look for whatever opportunities they can find, whether it's at another orchestra or a teaching position, or sometimes just leaving the music field altogether and, and going in a different direction. And do you, do you think the administrators really um, view that as a, a major loss to the institution? It, it seems like there are so many very very good young players that want orchestra jobs and it's it's hard uh to imagine that everybody really understands the value of a great you know principal clarinet for example um is is when you talk to people that are on the other side of this this discussion do you feel like they understand the value of the specific individuals that are in the orchestra uh, I think it's important to realize that there isn't a universal opinion 
on that. Uh, in the way you phrased the question initially, do, and I'm paraphrasing, do the decision makers, the executive leadership team on the Minnesota Orchestra board and CEO level of management, do they care as much about whether or not players leave? I think in this specific situation, the answer is no, they don't. Uh, it doesn't matter to them, regardless of whatever the justification is behind it. As to the issue of being able to replace the people who have left with young, hungry players, that's always been talked about. But if it were as simple as just plugging in good players, regardless of what their age is, then the orchestra field wouldn't be that problematic to begin with. There's something I call the, <laughs> the fragile powerhouse with orchestras, which it will take 20 years to really build a unique collective sound and artistic threshold. You'll have key musicians and leadership positions, first chair positions, concert master, obviously, uh, that come together to build something that's more than the sum of its parts. But the fragile end of that is it only takes a season or so to rip it all apart and start the cycle over again. So mm -hmm. do you... Go ahead, Tim. Uh, we've, we've talked about the orchestra and the management, but do you think that the audience is going to be that interested in coming back to an orchestra that hasn't played in over a year? Or, or do you think that they are looking to spend their entertainment dollars somewhere else? Both. Uh, the audience is also far less universal than people realize. And <clears throat> even outside the realm of uh, collective bargaining or labor dispute, the, the dichotomy of the typical orchestra audience, especially for a 52-week orchestra, is far more diverse than people think. There's your core audience members who notice little changes in the artistic threshold, the organization, how an orchestra plays under different conductors. They're familiar with repertoire and they have very firm expectations and they will not hesitate to walk away if those expectations are not met. You've got a group of people in the middle who have some experience, maybe aren't as comfortable or have the same level of uh, vested interest in the organization. And then there are your casual attendees, which are increasingly more important to orchestras than non-subscriber single ticket buyers that maybe only come once or twice a year. Those are the people who are going to be far more likely to walk away sooner and stay away longer. Mm-hmm. And, and do so you, do you go ahead. Do you see do you see a way out? Uh, you know, a way out for Minnesota, given that you know the, they probably alienated most of their people who who you know who pay the rent. I think it's a very apt observation. Uh, the problem with Minnesota is it's degraded into a level of a labor dispute where, in order to win, someone else has to lose. That's the, that's the lion of sand, we can use that phrase again, drawn by the two major stakeholder parties, the employer and the employees. In a situation like this, I've never seen this level of animosity be resolved without major changes, meaning different people, people leaving, different people coming in, in order to be able to move the organization forward. Uh, I think personally and professionally, that the organization has crossed a threshold where it is not going to be the same artistic ensemble it had been before. It's going to be a very dark and depressing place to work uh, on both in the office and on stage. Uh, they've got a lot of major problems and whether or not the people that are in place right now can continue to be in a position to pull them out of it, I think the likelihood of that is very low. Mm -hmm. So they've now lost the whole the whole season, um, which has never happened before, right? Um, it has happened. I'm trying to think of the group that it was a smaller budget orchestra, and the name is just escaping me right now. It'll pop up in 40 minutes later, um, <laughs> but it is very very rare. Yeah, I mean even even uh, we it, when we first started the show, it was in the middle of the Detroit uh, symphonies problems in i guess that was 2010 2011 season um and they came back i think in like april ish uh so yes. they, they played about four four or five concert weekends uh, and 
we talked then about how how difficult it was going to be for them to come back um and so uh the minnesota orchestra has gone even one past that are, are there other aside from you know missing those concerts are there any other labor disputes in in the recent past to drew that you think have reached this level of of animosity and and come back from it and if and if so how did they do that Oh, and come back from it. Um, That's the real key right there. Would you say even that the Detroit Symphony has come back? No, not at all. Uh, I think that's actually a point to where you're going to get a lot of people arguing about it because there's a very strong public relations push to make it look like it it is going in that direction. Right. But if you were looking at that organization in a for-profit sense, let's say it's a company you want to invest in, you want to look at the level of workplace satisfaction. You want to look at whether or not their their new business plan is producing the sort of results that are genuine uh, to to be able to reach the sort of goals and produce the sort of stability that they had claimed they would produce. I don't think any of those scenarios are in place right now. Hmm. So I, I've mentioned a couple of times this Detroit situation, and uh, we also talked this season about a few other orchestras that were having um, similar, though, as, as you pointed out to me, Drew, not the same problems, uh, St. Paul just across town and San Francisco. And the the result, I think, to the audience is is basically the same. Like there's there's there was an orchestra, and now there's not an orchestra. Um, but obviously the causes are very different and the solutions are very different. Um, so maybe you could talk about that a little bit about how it's easy for us on the, on the outside of, of these, uh, labor disputes to just say, uh, that first of all, that they're all the same. And second of all, that they're all arguing about silly things, but, um, maybe you could explain why that that's not the case and how all of these are, are, are their own unique snowflakes of, fights uh that's a perfect way to put it their own unique snowflake of fights uh, <laughs> and episode title it was 10 or 20 <laughs> years ago uh i had a, a a recent board retreat exercise that i conducted with a, a an Ixom level orchestra where i put a list of all of the major disputes in the last few years uh up and asked the board members to draw correlations between them And everybody was trying to basically gravitate toward that. Well, it's all about money and there's there's a problem with money. They don't have enough of it. And so they're fighting about that. Well, to a level, that's it. But the point of the exercise was exactly what you mentioned, David, is there isn't a correlation between a number of them. For example, in San Francisco, the fight was about which which or how big of a slice of an expanding pie each stakeholder should get, which is very different than the dispute going on in St. Paul, Minnesota, Detroit, Louisville, uh, where the pie is shrinking. And it's, it's, it's over what size that smaller pie is going to be and then how it's divided. So you have a labor dispute over growth and a labor dispute over austerity. Those are two very different perspectives. Uh, and trying to throw them all together into, well, things are bad right now, that really misses the overall point of how different the field is just from one city to the next. Well, I think that really is one of the things that surprised us the most about the San Francisco Symphony Strike is that, you know, we, we think of orchestras that are doing well financially, they're right at the top of the list um, in the United States. And it, it, we, at least I, dumb Dave, think th- I think of orchestras having these problems as the orchestras that are struggling financially, and they they weren't, and and of course they're they're back, and things seem to be going well for them now. Um, but uh, do you, do you think the Minnesota orchestra has a chance to come back at this point, or should we just give up on them? Well, there's always an outside chance. (laughs) So you're saying there's a chance. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Never shut the door, even if it's a miracle. Something could always happen. And stranger things in life certainly have. All right. But uh, if if you were a betting man, I I don't know if I'd bet on that one. So 
That's incredible. I can't even think about it, like just oh, sorry guys, no orchestra anymore. Especially like Minnesota. A, that that happened um, with the Honolulu Symphony, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Uh, um, there's a symphony that's back now, but it's it's not it's not what it was beforehand. Right. Man, NBC Orchestra. Let's bring that back. <laughs> How very it retro just, of you. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to a person on the outside. I don't I, I just wonder how you go about explaining this to somebody uh who's not, you know, uh an orchestra dork like us, but um, you know, just a fan, like somebody who just likes to likes classical music, likes to go and and see the orchestra every now and then. explain it to them. You know, well, these two people couldn't get along. Mommy you know, and daddy like are the, fighting. Right. It's like the referees strike, like, you know, earlier in the NFL season. Like, and it, did, it made sense to nobody. And, and this, this seems the same to be the same thing where it's, you know, why, why can't we just figure it out? Uh, that's a that's a perfect way to look at things, and it's a real failing in the field, even at the level of this uh, contentious dispute uh, scenario that's in place, where it's a failure in communication of stakeholders to properly define what their positions are, why things are happening the way they are to the public outside of spin-driven sound bites. The, the standard management soundbite is things are bad, we can't do as much as we used to do, and we have to cut back because that's the way things are supposed to be. But that doesn't begin to touch the surface of things that are actually the issue going on inside the organization. And musicians are equally as incapable of being able to properly express their positions to a public that doesn't understand or have a frame of reference is what you're really talking about to be able to, to, to have a minimum threshold of understanding to determine whether or not a position has any merit whatsoever. So would you say that, well, the, I mean, I, I feel like in the news, it always comes down to, well, it's just the, the, the musicians want more money. The, sa the salary offer was not good enough. I mean, I know there are other issues involving like you know, community outreach um, other concerts that may be programmed or um, or benefits or whatever it may be but would you find that when you work with orchestras or when you're involved in, in conversations like these that it really does come down to a number or salary no it's more often than not about control uh, than it is an actual number and this is the old 1960s fight, and even though it's being wrapped in the economic downturn uh, environment that we're still struggling to get out of, it's about not just control, but dominant control. Being able to have the leeway and authority to be able to make uh, the sort of strategic decisions that that particular stakeholder group wants for the organization without the other side having any legally enforceable checks or balances into it. Uh, so yes, the numbers are obviously very uh, salient to, the, to whatever specific fight you're talking about, mm -hmm. but in the end, they're still fighting for control. That makes it even more infuriating. It does. <laughs> it should. And that's exactly what people need to do is to get upset when they see this with all parties, not assigning blame, or falling into the very uh, susceptible trap of putting a political ideology to it. If you're a conservative, mm -hmm. you tend to side with, with the employer. If you're a liberal, you tend to side with the employee. And that really doesn't come into play as much here. Uh, it, should, it should be stop trying to fight over control and work together. That's what your responsibility is ultimately in the end of the nonprofit organization. Well, and that's sure. that's really frustrating for the the, the other members of, of that musical community who are totally powerless in in have in, in that negotiation at all, and and there's not a way that you can shout at them and say that to them really. Well, you can. I think actually, 
the audience as a whole is an underserved stakeholder. Uh, they have far more control over an organization than probably what's known. I think Tim's point or question before about what can the stakeholders do even if they're able to get uh, their mind around what's going on, forming audience associations that are independent of either organization, or I'm sorry, either stakeholder, uh, and being able to have a line of communication with management, even if it's just a rant or a letter of support, uh, they, they need to be inspired to do that. And you don't see either stakeholder really encouraging people to do that uh, to the degree that really should happen. Yeah, and, and for, for people uh, on the outside, I think, you know, if you're, not, if you're not up on the news or up on how these things go in other places, you just see an orchestra that can't manage itself and it's failing and that makes you think that all orchestras do this and that classical music is not a viable art form, it can't survive. I'll buy some CDs and I'll go on my, with my life. Yeah. I mean, I feel people who even are classical enthusiasts or who do follow the news, they see what's happening in the orchestral world that then automatically that pops into mind and say, oh, well, this is indicative of a hate for classical music, uh, of, of the of the times are changing and this is the end. Um, I, I feel like that sentiment goes around a lot, even within the classical community, um, just by seeing you know, the, the problems with the orchestras today. Sure. Um, I would say at the same time, go ahead and look back to the civil rights era. And there was certainly a substantial amount of, of, of uh, disruption there. But was it indicative of a system that was unsustainable? You know, democracy? No, of course it wasn't. Uh, and it's a bit of an apples and oranges comparison there. But it's still so tempting to wrap your mind around an easy to understand simple point everything is bad so it all must not be working when it's really more involved with the individual variables not just the individual community but the people involved are the management or i'm sorry are the managers and the executive leadership team maximizing the true potential of the area are the musicians playing the part that they should be doing are they rising to a higher artistic level than they had before. You know, there should be enough excitement and mojo in an organization uh, to really help it maximize that potential, which does vary from one year to the next, mm -hmm. to be able I, to produce something that is a healthy bystander, or I'm sorry, a healthy byproduct. I think it's interesting that, um, you know, we saw in San Francisco and then previously in Chicago, both happening for opening Carnegie is the strikes happened right before travel um now is this just a is this a a a, a strategy by orchestra musicians and they right before you know uh, hey guys we're getting on the road and we want our voice heard so let's bat let's bag this whole thing right now and put oh, the sure. pressure on absolutely it's it's an age-old leverage point uh if you want to get into the finer points of labor disputes both sides have a very uh, tried and true toolbox of pressure points that they apply on the other side to try to see how far the other side's going with their bluffing. Hmm. It's brinkmanship. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, I don't, is is there a way that we could? Um, so you you had a, a post on your blog this week. There's a reason why so many of the new orchestra, m new model discussions are dead ends. Um, and I'm wondering if there exists a, a, a model under, under which we can maybe mitigate some of these disputes and solve problems before we get to bargaining for the CBA mm -hmm. uh, so that we can solve problems, you know, without ending seasons uh, or, or canceling concerts. Is there a model that allows for that? You, 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 you've um, linked to something about startups and you've mentioned the, the magic startup word disruption. Um, 
is is there a way or that's that's different than the way we do things now? Because it seems like this model's been around for you know ever. It has, and one of the frustrating things about the the new model discussions is there isn't any real universal description of what a new model is. In the end, the model of an orchestra, if you look at the economic model, is very simple. They got to take in revenue and they got to spend money. It all comes down to the people that are involved. There are groups that use a traditional model that have a very positive labor relationship right now. They don't have issues. They're managing their debt just fine. And you don't hear about them because that's not terribly sexy or exciting news to talk about. Uh, so it isn't, it isn't so much the model that needs to change. It's the training and expectations of the people involved in the model that need to change. So you're saying that we need to hire better people. <laughs> well, it's always better if you can, can hire better people. But the reality of the nonprofit working environment, and I'm thinking board level here, which are volunteers, they're not employees, there's a dearth of uh, preparation on the board level. And I'll go on a bit of a divergence here that I think is relevant in that during periods of economic downturn and stress, you see factions start to have a dominant voice in the overall strategic discussion. On the board side, it does tend to fall more on a heavily conservative, ideologically driven mantra. On the musician side, they're what I call the conspiracy theorists. No matter what comes out of a board member's mouth, they're lying. And when those two sides meet, what they're really looking for is a fight, and they will get one. And the people who are typically tasked with, with moderating those voices tend to become marginalized or they get sucked up into those camps. You said something uh, just, just a second ago that, that, um, that really struck a chord with me when, when you said that... Uh, what we hear about is, um, you know, the the sexier news of of labor strife, uh, and we we don't normally hear about, at least, I don't normally hear about the Minnesota Orchestra when they weren't having labor problems. Really? Well, I mean, I knew about them, but I I, I didn't hear all that much about you know their the music. The news they coverage the, has certainly gone up since the sure, definitely. Yeah. And and I think that that's a problem uh, in in the system where we sensationalize the the conflict and and of course that's what we're I mean that's kind of good storytelling is find the conflict and and show that part but but in this case it just makes us look bad and I'm not saying don't report on it I'm just saying maybe we could also report on good things that are happening in other places. The, you know, the, there doesn't seem to be a lot of good orchestra labor news. Yeah. I remember we had a show a little while ago about good news and orchestras, and we were like, what's going on with this good news stuff? And we, had, <laughs> we had to ask Drew because we couldn't find it anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, Tim, I, I mean, I, I think I kind of agree with you. We, we do tend to say, sensationalize these orchestra disputes a little bit. But even even the fact that they are happening more often these days it it has kind of tempered the uh the discussion a little bit i think uh, like if, oh some orchestra has has gone on strike it's like oh well Been geez, desensitized you know. yeah I'm, i think so i absolutely think so i think that that people expect orchestras to always be on strike <laughs> and that's the problem it's yeah. like you every every five years you expect three of the four major American sports to, to have a labor problem and it's just annoying and people hate it. Nobody likes this. I think you're right and it, it is turning into a very uh, expected cycle which is very dangerous just for nonprofit performing arts in general because you do desensitize your public to that particular type of violence uh, and they only care if there is a problem and to those fringe voices, all that does is add fuel to that fire. Uh, they're happy when they're fighting, and you want to try to pull back out of that as much as you possibly can. 
But Tim, the point you made actually before about whether or not people uh, care or be able to have an understanding of what goes on, I'm thinking in a traditional media perspective here, like newspapers especially and magazines, is the readership doesn't really understand why it's worth reading to begin with. Because if they don't know much about the organization, if they don't know much about what they do, why why waste the the white space on talking about that for something that they're not going to stay tuned to, so they're not going to see the advertisements on the page. Whereas a labor dispute, just go look at the comment threads to most of <laughs> the newspaper articles, and they fall right into almost painfully stereotypical dogma uh, that's uh, politically driven. Because that's what people can wrap their heads around. That's terrible. Well, it is. It is terrible. So we we've talked about this in the past, and when, whenever I mention these orchestra labor disputes to Tim, um, Tim, one of your first reactions is always, "Screw it! Why don't the musicians just go start their own organization?" Right? This I'm not making yeah. this up. Right? No, I'm not no, putting no. words in that. your mouth. I say that. So. We have we have the expert here. Why why don't they, Drew? <laughs> well, in some cases they do. There was one very very successful um, scenario with the Colorado Springs Philharmonic, which previously was the Colorado Springs Symphony Orchestra. And I'll make a very long story short. The musicians had uh, found themselves in a, a rock and a hard place sort of scenario where there were some very tough. Uh, positions being placed on them by their employer that they didn't accept. And they did make the collective decision that it would be better to simply move in a new direction. Now, they didn't form a self-managed or self-ruled kind of orchestra, but they simply got a group of board members and uh, even an executive management team in place, formed the 501c3, got ready to launch it just as soon as the other organization uh, flipped from reorganization to liquidation bankruptcy, picked up some of the assets even at a good price, and then just started back up. And that's an organization that, although they haven't quite reached the same level they were before all of this happened, they've grown at a much faster rate than organizations that are still trying to pull themselves out of a big haircut. Yeah. I remember, uh, I'm from Syracuse, and I was, uh, I was teaching at Ithaca when the Syracuse uh, Symphony... Uh, went down. And I remember talking to a few members saying that they were going to try to do something on their own. And, and I think they might have even done some services throughout the summer for a little while. But uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where that story ended up. Maybe you probably know more than I do. Um, it, it just seems like, yeah, you're not going to get health benefits. And yeah, you've got to buy a ton of repertoire. Um, but uh, and, and those things may be cost prohibitive to even try to, to think about starting. But, uh, you know, I, there's got to be some way to break a stranglehold by, a, a, you know, a very ideological minority, uh, you know, it, it, within, a, within a region for classical music. I mean, it, it, that's, that's the, the way that I, I see it in a lot of... Uh, in a lot of the 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 ways that these these orchestra things happen, uh, you know that that there's a few people fighting over a couple of nickels, and er, er, everybody else has to suffer. You I don't even know if that was a question. <laughs> no, I, you you couldn't be more right. And I'll let you guys in on kind of a a great big secret in this business right now, which is the labor disputes that are that are prevailing through the business. Uh, if there is a common thread, it's, it's, it's that control issue. And on the employee side of the equation, the reason why most of these scenarios end up with settlements that are large concessions, where ostensibly the employees folded, uh, is because of fear. Fear over losing their income, fear over losing the benefits, fear over whatever it's going to be. But they're not going to have as much as they used to have. And that's a difficult position for musicians to pull themselves out of. But 
the only way to truly break free of a cycle that's going to just be a continuing series of abuses ostensibly is to do what you mentioned. They, they're going to have to realize that they're going to lose a lot of what they used to have. That life is gone. If your artistic principles mean as much to you as, as you're stating publicly in most cases, then you need to be willing to step out of the organization, force the current group into liquidation bankruptcy, and start your own organization, which means you have to go out and start to cultivate a board of directors. You have to go out and be able to put an organization together that is attractive enough to want to bring in capable artistic managers, which you have to have. You're not going to run it on your own. I don't mm -hmm. care how many musicians think they can run an orchestra on their own. It's not going to happen. If it does, it happens very dysfunctionally. Uh, I think that's, that's a common feature of a lot of organizations is that everybody thinks that they can do everyone else's job. Um, and, and it's certainly the, the, the case with uh, the musical organizations that I've been a part of, that everybody, everybody all, all, all the people in charge think they can play the oboe, and the oboist thinks that he or she can, can, run, the, can run the group just fine. Right? Well, that's, that's, that's just it. Board members who really don't know think that every musician is easily replaceable because there's a thousand kids out there who are doing an amazing job coming out of conservatory, and they're good too, right? So let's just plug them in. It's cogs and wheels, simple. And, of course, that doesn't happen. And on the musician side, you don't just get someone to go in and market and sell tickets, and they're just going to be able to work suddenly. Um, what I would really love to see, and this is something I hear from young arts managers uh, that are in the 20, early 30-something sect. And in a lot of cases, they do have a really good base understanding of how the economics of nonprofit business work, uh, the cash flow problem, which is core to uh, nonprofit performing arts organizations, and to see them be able to put together an operational and logistical model that you can plug a good executive leadership team in to be able to focus on the unearned income, do donations and large gifts and then maximize your earned income through ticket sales through that highly efficient operational model and have a group of musicians with a different degree of stakeholdership in the organization to be able to develop a, an environment that is more conducive of trust than what currently exists. So we lost one of one of our cogs uh, a couple of minutes ago for uh, technical reasons. Uh, Patrick uh, lost his internet service for a few moments, but I think he's got it back. So we're going to try getting back. Just give me a, a couple of seconds to, to, to make that happen. Yes. <laughs> Favorite part. Hmm. Oh uh, man, um, I had a really good question too. Oh, so a few weeks ago we had composer Alex Shapiro on the show, um, uh, and she's great. And we uh, we were talking about um, funding new compositions, and I said something about grants, and Alex like jumped on that, and she said that she thinks that um, composers. And she was just talking about composers, so I won't, you know, put words in her mouth. Rely too much on those grants, and that there are there are other sources of income. Can you imagine a a a, a business model for orchestras that would have them relying primarily on kind of that direct uh, ticket sales and donations right. income, as opposed to uh, funding from from other sources? No, uh, it's, it's just not going to happen. For individual artists, quartets, small groups, composers will be the same as even soloists. Yes, the earned income model is a very realistic, very promising uh, business model to use. The phrase I used earlier about an orchestra being more than the sum of its parts, that extends through to the economic structure and the business model is there simply isn't enough earned income, even if you had a hall with 3,000 seats, you double the ticket prices to what you're paying right now, 
you're not going to be able to pay a staff what they're being paid, which is not great right now. The musicians aren't going to be able to have benefits, anything uh, other than a very low per service wage. Uh, and conductors can pretty much kiss their salaries goodbye as well, too. It, it just isn't possible. You have to have some sort of contributed unearned income stream to be able to balance and offset that that gap of being able to produce something other than the old pre-1960 model of basically a pickup orchestra every time you want to do a concert. Okay. I mean, does the composer in residence sort of fill a different role then? I mean, that's more of a... I mean, like the, the, the organizations, there's commissioning money for new works there, but I mean, they're, you're, you work for the orchestra. Right. I, well, we've had this conversation before on the show, and this is one of the things that's always amazed me about that composer and residence model. And I've expressed to you guys before, in a sense of, tell, in, in a sense of, of a collective sense of all composers, in I have no idea why composers allow themselves to be treated the way they are. <laughs> if you get treated like a dog, why are you surprised when people treat you like a dog? <laughs> the composer residence model is always uh, astounding to me. Why is why aren't there composer positions that are part of the collective bargaining agreement? I do remember you speaking well, about that. Composers and, aren't part of the union. This is something I, I teach a music business class, and we talk about all the unions that are involved in putting on a show, and we list all these unions and who they represent. And then at the end, I'm like, anybody know what re union represents composers? And the answer is, ah, that's a trick question. There isn't one. Right. Um, so I think one of the reasons they're not represented is because they're not part of the group that does the, the represented in the, in the collective bargaining agreement is that they're not part of that group. That's um, party to the, the agreement. That's exactly it. And this is the dichotomy inside what I think uh, is a problem inside the American Federation of Musicians in that orchestra musicians have their artistic belief core value set, let's say, of what they think new music should be or shouldn't be. And that is at odds with the basic nature of unionized representation. If you really believe in the core principles of unionized representation, you, you shouldn't make those sorts of distinctions. We're either all in this together or we're not in this together. You can't say we're all in this together except composers because we want to be able to say what we do like or don't like about that in a way that's different than we do about our instrumental colleagues. Yeah. Well, that's, that's it's something that instrumental colleagues have is, is tenure that when they, when yes. they do make you know, interesting creative decisions... Those are something that they're kind of held harmless from the, the direct repercussions of, of people disagreeing with those decisions. Yeah, musicians um, are indefinitely, could potentially indefinitely be hired by an orchestra, whereas a, a composer in residence position will be three, four years max. Right. Right. And right. It's, so it's essentially like per, most composers are, are the equivalent so what, what, of per service subs. Yeah. So what vested interest does the composer have in the orchestra? If it's if they're out of there in a few years, exposure. Uh, I think most of the composers that I see who take the composer in residence position are thrilled to get them because it's some sort of benchmark or threshold of making it in that particular career track, where now that composer is able to say, "I've had this orchestra who's been able to play these works." Doesn't matter necessarily if they were great or not, but they've reached this level of validation. Uh, and it's always been very curious to me why that's been as important as it is. Well, I'm not saying that the that having the position is is not important. Um, just what I'm saying is like as far as when things break down within an organization, and whereas the composer in residence does fill an important role um, in in having I don't know two two new works possibly in a season. Um, you know where where is their voice and and why. Why did should they feel that their voice should count to um, to fixing the situation? I, I mean, think, they go, go ahead. I think you're right. They don't have a voice in the organization because they are a temporary ad hoc 
part of the organization. They have that expiration date. Everybody knows they're going to be gone. And if anything, I think it actually circles around to a point of control that we were talking about before. Um, years ago, I know Molly Sheridan is a friend of the show, uh, and yes, you guys definitely. have talked to her before. When she was still at New Music Box, she invited me to come in and moderate a discussion about this very topic. And Jerry Schwartz was part of it. Robert Levine was part of it. Uh, David Lennon, who's not in the AFM anymore, was part of it. Uh, and Henry Fogel was there, and Christopher Theophanides uh, as part of this panel. And I found it fascinating that the union side wasn't overly interested in, in getting something like a composer into the collective bargaining agreement, because that would give them too much of a voice, and it was at odds with what I had just mentioned before. And on the executive side of it, which would be the Henry Fogel, Jerry Schwartz, decision-maker kind of attitude, that would mean a loss of control. They get to really pick who comes into the organization. And when you have a, pa a position of power and control, you're not typically very excited about giving it up. That's interesting. And cede it to someone else like a composer. And when, when we were talking... Uh year or two ago about the 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 creation of this new organization new music usa and the kind of merging of the american music center and the american composers forum um and what's the third group i'm leaving out um uh, american music center american composers forum and the somewhere else anyway this is not important <laughs> oh my god it feels so bad not important uh the 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 thing that was interesting was they went and did these um these kind of town hall discussions around the country kind of explaining people what was going on and asking them what they thought they could do better and they said they told us afterwards that they 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 got some really great feedback and it was something they wanted to keep doing uh, is I don't know if they've continued to do them if they have I don't know about it but um at the one in New York there were specific questions about how this new organization, um, whether it was the, the new version of the American Composers Forum or whether it was New Music USA, um, how they could kind of act as a union for composers and arrangers uh, in a way that other organizations either don't represent composers or don't do these union-like things. Um, so... I, I wonder if if there is somewhere down the road where the American Composers Forum or somebody somebody like that could take on the role of a union and represent composers' interests in that kind of agreement. Now that that I think all of a sudden gets a lot more complicated when when those agreements become three party agreements instead of two party agreements, um, but. I, I don't know if there's a, a way... It seems like it, what Drew is saying is that there there's too much at stake for the AFM to let this whole huge group of people into their organization all at once. Well, um, I so. think the opposite there, actually. It's not too much at stake. I think that they they have too much to lose. That's what I mean, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's a little dangerous... Well, 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 first of all, let's say there was actually a separate union from the AFM for composers, not a service organization, which uh, is going to be out there promoting the value and rights of conductors, or, I'm sorry, uh, composers. If you don't have a collective bargaining agreement, then ostensibly nothing is enforceable and you're still just right. betting on the good graces of someone else anyway. But it won't be really a three-party structure if the uh, organization puts together a collective bargaining agreement with composers. It's no different than what exists now where uh, IATSE contracts are separate from the AFM contracts. And in operas, you can throw in the AGMA contract on top of it. AGMA, IATSE, and the AFM are going to have, obviously, closer aligned goals together. But they still have a separate agreement with the employer. <laughs> and in an opera's case, it's not all that unusual to see both sides kind of conspire together to get something for that particular group that 
will be defined in a way that the employer doesn't have to give it to one of the other unions. Yeah, that's interesting. And that other, com- that other organization was Meet the Composer, by the way. Oh, of course it was. I, want, I, I want to make sure everyone gets their, gets their plug. No, Meet the Composer is great. So you don't get angry letters later. Right. Yes. All the angry letters. Because uh, we our, get... <laughs> what? All our angry letters, yeah. We get a all, lot of them. Yeah, do we? No. I think you Well, I just don't them. tell you. Oh, okay. Because I, I keep the threats to, to myself. Right. And they're written by natural light. Exactly. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway... Um, We've been we've been going on this for a while. I want to move into some of our news stories, a lot of which are related to some of the things that we've talked about. A couple of things about um, operas, uh, opera companies uh, around the world. The Metropolitan Opera, the New York Metropolitan Opera, has decided to completely get rid of their uh, their dance company. So they've they've been scaling it back over the over the last few years. They have now com- completely uh, gotten rid of the remaining members. They all took buyouts this past week. Um, Peter Gelb of the the Met says that uh, this is, of course, in part a cost saving measure, but it's also in part uh, a creative decision. As working with a lot of different choreographers, they want to bring in their own dancers. That to me sounds a little disingenuous, but who knows? Um, and also, La Scala is scaling back in Milan, uh, scaling back from thirteen operas, which is their usual opera season, down to ten. Um, and they also have a, a ballet company that performs separately from the opera company, uh, much more than the Metropolitan Opera Company, uh, Met, the Met Opera's ballet did. Um, the La Scala Ballet performs separately quite a bit. And uh, between the 16 productions that the opera and the ballet will be doing next season, only eight of them will be new productions. So these are going to be mostly recycled uh, productions. Um and they are citing specifically Italian austerity measures. Um, so one thing that, that we touched on a little bit in, in describing the artistic integrity of these groups that are having to deal with budget shortfalls and all kinds of things um, is that what's happening, I think, here in both of these cases is that they're making creative decisions based on these financial limitations, which is always something that I think is, is a little troubling. Um, obviously there's, there's the other extreme where the composer says, you know what this string quartet needs? Helicopters. And (laughs) so you can, you can go to the other side as well, but, um, I, it always makes me sad when I see these creative decisions that are made by something like, you know, I'd really like to have a, a fourth percussionist or a fifth percussionist, but the, the orchestra won't pay another another player. Um, so, I, is that so, is this something that that factors into these discussions a lot? Is is the the creative freedom, Drew? Oh, absolutely. And this is where you're going to see more impact from the conductor in the process, where the conductors straddle this very odd world of on one part, they have their artistic programs that they want to do, and they have those standards, like I want the fourth percussion, I want the additional brass players, whatever it's going to be. But at the same time, they then tend to side on the management stereotypical positions of uh, flexibility, is the code word, of, which really means reducing musician tenure, being able to put the musicians they want, fire the ones they don't want because they don't like their sound or they don't think they play very well anymore. And they just don't want to deal with the whole work protection uh, measures that are in place with a collective bargaining agreement. Right. Uh, and if, if you look at how all this tends to in, intersect in a very ugly way in some cases, it, it, it's not really a great selling point for orchestra management. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose not. Uh, an, another thing that, that this brings up, uh, La Scala statement, specifically mentioned uh, Italian austerity, which is obviously much, much starker in uh, Europe and specifically Italy um, than it is in the United States. But obviously the United States is uh, under certain austerity measures as well. Um, And those went into effect just a couple of months ago. Um, But Drew, I I wonder if you are hearing a lot of people talk about... um, Austerity's impact specifically on on these upcoming seasons as they're as they're planning 
uh, for the future and relying so heavily on uh, certain kinds of subsidies. Um, do you do you see American austerity having as as stark an impact on the orchestra business as Italian austerity is having on La Scala? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it's a really good point and an observation you made is the austerity measures mentioned in the La Scala article are government driven because the ratio of revenue that comes in from government sources there is much larger than in the U.S. The U.S. being a capitalist based system is going to replace that government model with the private donation revenue or investment revenue. So the austerity measures that are being pushed within most U.S.-based groups are going to be those from financial lending institutions, banks. Uh, if you look at a couple of scenarios in particular, like in Detroit and in Philadelphia, and the one that's kind of brewing now in Nashville, is banks tend to take a very hard-lined, absolutely zero negotiation flexibility standpoint on you have to cut X number of dollars out of your budget on a regular basis in order for us to continue to lend you money or give you a line of credit. And in almost every single one of those cases, it will have exactly the opposite effect that the bank thinks it's going to produce because nonprofit performing arts organizations don't have the same uh, action reaction cycle that a uh, for profit business is going to have. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. interesting. Um, uh, another orchestra that is uh, having some financial problems right now is the the Oregon Symphony. We talked about them a, a, a while back earlier this season when they bailed on the Spring for Music uh, Festival in New York, which just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. Um, and bailing on Spring for Music, I don't think is is a, a huge deal, as we've talked about. Spring for Music is bailing on Spring for Music. Uh, next, the next uh, after next festival season. will be their last. That's which sounds like a threat, but it isn't. Um, the next <laughs> festival will be their last. You know, there, there might be like some donor or something that's like, here's five billion dollars. Right. <laughs> so they could resurrect it if that happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, all the big money people who watch this show. Right. Just uh, after you give five billion dollars to us, right. then give more to uh, Spring for Music because they do I've they do good work. With all the things that we we I think would like to do on the show, I bet we could go through five billion dollars. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> like in a week. <laughs> you have an the awfully stamp. high opinion of your ability to spend money. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if I could spend five billion dollars in in I don't know how long. It would take me more than a week though. Um, so the, anyway, the Oregon symphony, the players have agreed to forego, uh, their end of season salary payment. And they have also agreed to forego the salary increase, a 2.6% salary increase that's in their CBA for next season. Um, all together, that's going to save the Oregon symphony, uh, a little under $400,000, um, and I, and I know these sorts of things aren't aren't unheard of, Drew. But is that something that is going to play into their next uh, their next CBA when they when they sit down to bargain? Or do they is that a, um, a bargaining point for them to say, hey, I've we've already you know given up on almost four hundred thousand dollars. Give us a little something back. Oh sure, it happens all the time. Um, the amount of a positive impact it has will depend entirely on the people involved making the decisions at that future point in time. Uh, Oregon right now, it's important to remember, does does not have a chief executive officer in place. Uh, I think the reports about the cut are interesting in that they mention Carlos Calmer, their music director, and that there's no word on whether or not his compensation package has been impacted with this. Because from uh, a standpoint of executive compensation in the orchestra field really has mirrored very closely the for-profit executive culture in that uh, the CEO and music director compensation has increased at a substantially higher rate than the standard office middle manager and the standard base musician employee. I'm sorry, the standard base musician uh, uh, wage rate. And there's a lot of disingenuous uh, 
attitudes that can go into any kind of austerity measure if everybody's not willing to pony up and say exactly what it is that their cut is and be willing to have a degree of transparency to verify that information. Uh, if you're a donor, or let's say the audience member that Tim had mentioned before, how's it going to make you feel if the person leading the orchestra won't talk about what cut he or she is going to accept along with everyone else in the organization when it's big sensationalized news of the kind of cuts that the office and the musicians have to take. Yeah, that's 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 what I was I was just jotting down a note to to along those lines to say will taking that pay cut uh w will that uh, will Oregon try to get the audience on their side uh so to speak uh as some sort of power to negotiate their their next contract? And and will that have any effect, or does it does it, are my suspicions correct that the audience really doesn't matter in in these cases? The audience will still really matter. Um, whether or not the musicians are going to be in a position to cultivate that level of support, traditionally, I don't see musicians doing a very good job with this. They only reach out to their audience once things have become bad. Mm -hmm. Then after a deal is made, they don't talk to them anymore. Yeah. Uh, this is yeah. a, a horrible problem on the musician side of things. And you would think that with a union representing them, they would have a network or structure in place to teach them how to do these things and be able to help them maintain that level of communication with what should be one of their most important supporter groups in a time of a labor dispute. Uh, but funny enough, it doesn't happen that way. Well, it should be their supporter group all the time. I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. that is the relationship that, that you have as a musician. You play for the audience, and the audience is there to hear you. Nobody goes to the orchestra to think about the CEO. <laughs> like, nobody does that. They're Don't there tell the, the CEOs people. that. <laughs> I, I understand, but, but somebody needs to tell the CEOs that, right? The, well, like they, are the, yes. they should have the least power, and, and yet they, they somehow have the most power when it, well, comes, you know, well, it seems it like. I think it's less mysterious than maybe you're making it out to be. <laughs> uh, the CEO's role, if you have a CEO who's doing their job the right way, his or her job the right way, is they have to, from a very large standpoint, play referee. You have a board of directors who don't understand how the business works in a logistical day-to-day -day sense. They usually don't understand what's coined as the artistic temperament. Uh, and you have to balance all of those fringe voices we talked about before so they don't take over the discussion too much. A really good executive is honestly worth his or her weight in gold. The problem in the business is that degree of payment and reward and compensation is not usually requisite with, with what the results are. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, I, and I also think that the the it's natural for the musicians to feel this connection with the <clears throat> audience, and the audience to feel this connection with the musicians. Because, like Tim said, the musicians are playing for the audience, and the audience is going to hear the musicians. But that's that that connection, I think, is exclusive to the you know two hours that they're in the hall. The rest of the time, the dealings that the audience has is with the orchestra management. You know, they're buying subscriptions and individual tickets from the orchestra's website or on the phone or at the box office. They're not dealing with the musicians when they do every other part of, you know, being a, an orchestra patron. Every other part of that is dealing with or the, the management of the orchestra. And I don't, I don't, there's, I mean, not, not a good way for the, the musicians to be involved in, in those kind of transactional uh, relationships. I, it's, it's, I think, a little bit trickier to imagine a way for them to connect more directly with the audience. Um, and, you know, they, they, have, they start Facebook pages and, and Twitter pages and uh, blogs and everything when they're in these labor disputes and when they go on strike, but the, not until then do they do they even probably own a domain. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I I don't I don't know exactly what the the shape of that relationship would 
would take, what, what shape that relationship would take outside the so context. It's an even more difficult scenario when you look at the fact that the musicians are still employees and there's right. a degree of control again over the public relations message that's sent out where a typical management doesn't want to give musicians the degree of control to use the institution's communication channels to be able to deliver their message. So the only thing the musician group can do is go out and, and use their own direct communication channels. And they keep circling back to what we're, we talk about, that musicians don't do that until things you know go bad. And then it's nothing but a negative message that reinforces that sensationalist attitude that we were talking about before as well. And then when the settlement comes, it all disappears and there's no more connection. It only adds to that quandary Tim touched on before of how's, how's the patron supposed to ultimately feel about all of this? The only time you want to talk to me is when you want to tell me how bad your employer is. And <laughs> the only time the employer wants to talk about that is when they want to say how greedy the musicians are going to be and beat up on one another. But when things are okay, why don't I hear from these stakeholders other than to ask me for money or to buy a ticket? Yeah, that's this is a great point. Sure, and I well just to just to finish that idea, I think most of the time the patron just says, "I just want to hear Brahms four, and I really don't care about all of this other nonsense. Like, I just want to go to the concert, and and that, uh, you know that." This other, these other shenanigans um, really take a, away from that good musical experience, mm -hmm. and, and it seems it seems like um, the the orchestra, the the members, the the labor, I guess, um, you know, gets very wrapped up in their messaging about how the, how bad the other guys are and the administration gets met, wrapped up in their messaging and they don't really ever seem to connect toward making sounds and and that's that, that, that's really all the audience cares about at least as far as i understand it you know and that's an interesting point because i think that's one where you're going to start to hear more and more uh disagreement with in a lot of the new model style of thinking, which is they're going to say, no, that's not what the audience wants anymore. It's not just the concert experience. It's, it's now pick your topic du jour. It's how do we connect with the community? How are we, how are we having an education presence or an outreach message or all these terms that really have no firm definition? When in the end, you, you do really need to think about the most basic core element of what you do, which is as a performing arts organization, perform art yeah you have to get that good before you can even start to think about all these other efforts and you lose that core focus and that's where things start to really fall apart yeah well it, we're, we're running a little long so i want to mention a few a couple other things before we wrap up first of all um on wednesday when everyone else in the classical music world was blogging and tweeting about the centennial of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, oh. the New York Philharmonic uh, announced a really interesting sounding new festival, the New York Phil Biennial, um, which is going to happen next May and June. Uh, and this is going to be a festival that focuses on, on new music um, and in not just new music generally, but specifically seeming seems to be... I, I say new, but some of it is like Boulez and... Uh, George Benjamin, who are less new. Uh, but anyway, there, it focuses on um, more avant-garde new music, more strange sounds. A lot of times when we talk about new music, especially new music that orchestras are playing, it's very, very accessible. It sounds like film scores, um, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not a very good representative sample of the new music that people are making. So this festival uh, was just announced on Wednesday. It's going to be at a bunch of different venues, not just uh, Avery Fisher Hall. It's going to include a ton of great composers, Christopher Rouse, Peter Itvis, uh Matthias Pincher. H.K. Uh, Gruber. H.K. Gruber, indeed. Uh, Rindy Eckert is going to be a part of this as well. Um, there's a Boulez-themed concert from the Orchestra of St. Luke's, so it's not just the New York Phil. Um, uh, and the Orchestra of St. Louis is also doing this George Benjamin themed concert. 
Um, the there are a lot of groups that are participating in this. The Gotham Chamber Opera, the uh, American Composers Orchestra, they're doing their their annual readings during this festival, and the Bang on a Can All Stars are going to participate as well to bring uh, uh, a little bit less uh, crazy out there music. Um, I think Julia Wolf was on there, and um, anyway, should be a, a really amazing few weeks in to, to be in New York next year if you're into new music. A lot of times when we talk about orchestra stuff on the show, people are like, why are you talking about orchestras? They don't do any new music. You guys are composers. Well, see, it's right here on my legal pad. They're doing some next year. So uh, go to New York, and you'll hear it. Uh, you know speak- who's, uh, go ahead. You know who's recently... Um, you're talking about the ACO. Did you want to give us some news is on, it, on, the, on, a, on our next guest? Uh, well, why don't you, oh, since well, this, is, this is your booking. <laughs> My booking. Okay. Well, uh, on a future show coming up soon, uh, we'll have a uh, composer, Derek Bramell, recently appointed uh, artistic director of the ACO on the show. We'll be happy to hear about um, what his position will entail and uh, his career in general. He's a great, great person in our, in our world that... Uh, has yet to be on the show, and it's a long time coming. Indeed. We're looking forward to that. And that'll be next week, and we're moving the, the schedule next week for, to to uh, get him on the show. We're going to be at 5 Eastern time, and I'll, I'll mention that again in a little bit. Uh, instead of our regular pick of the week this week, this week we are, as classical music world want, is, is want to do, we have all been fetishizing anniversaries that are multiples of 50, um, this last couple of weeks brought us, as I mentioned earlier, the centennial of the Rite of Spring, also the bicentennial of the birth of Richard Wagner. Um, so, dirty. you know, whatever. Um, and Alex Ross, I think, if anybody had the best way to commemorate these two anniversaries, well, everybody else is blogging about the first time they heard the Rite of Spring or how great Wagner is or how many dozens of ring cycles you can go here around the world this year. Alex Ross is celebrated on his blog with the anti-anniversary week by presenting um, eight blog posts, each featuring uh, a a different up-and-coming young composer who perhaps in 100 years someone else will be celebrating. Some really interesting people, uh, including a friend of the show, Tristan Parrish. So uh, check those out. We'll have a link to that on our site. Um, I wanted to uh, mention something really quick. Um, There's a a short Elliot Carter interview that the uh, Carnegie Hall put on YouTube, um, and he talks about hearing the Rite of Spring at its U.S. premiere. Wow. (laughs) So I think we should have like some sort of running joke that's like, how old is he? He was so old (laughs) that he heard that. It's just Elliot Carter old jokes, basically. (laughs) That's well, those those will be a lot like uh, um, uh, Arizona Senator John McCain. Old jokes, right? Yes, yes. Right. But actually, he was there at the U.S. premiere. How incredible! Well, I is think that? John McCain was too. <laughs> um. <laughs> anyway, and you had a seniors discount then. That's then. right. That's right. Um, Drew, thank you so much for being on the show. It's always a treat to have you uh, join us on Sunday mornings, and you teach us so much, and we have such a great time. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, do you have anything coming up uh, that you want to plug? Uh, sure. Plug away. Bit. Anything you want. Uh, in uh, June, I'll be at the uh, Conductors Guild conference, uh, serving as a mentor. In uh, August, I'll be the keynote speaker for the Oxum conference, uh, which is the Canadian uh, Orchestra Players uh, Conference of the American Federation of Musicians, talking about fourth generation theory. Uh, in November, I'll be at the National Arts Marketing Performance, talking about uh, website stuff. And uh, uh, a plug for my wife, who is now the new concert master for the Chattanooga Symphony Orchestra. So any of your viewers are out in that area, you're going to be able to get to enjoy her with the orchestra next season. And what's what's her name for people that don't know who your wife is? (laughs) Sorry, say that one more time when I'm not talking. (laughs) Holly Mulcahy. All right. HollyMulcahy.com. There you go. So you can go, you can go hear her uh, with the Chattanooga Orchestra. Thank you so much. You can find Drew at adaptatration.com and orchestraconsulting.com and ventureindustriesonline.com. And uh, am, I, am I leaving anything out? No, no. <laughs> I, I, I really have to start bumping up my online press. That's, r- that's right. <laughs> He's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> That's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Uh, you can find links to all the stories that we've talked about. 
excuse me, all the stories that we talked about on soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can also leave us a comment there. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. We're at Sound Notion as a group. I'm at Dave McDow. Uh, Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Tim is at Tim Rosenberg. And Drew is at Adaptistration. Um, if you'd like to suggest a story to be on the show, you can tweet it with hashtag SN Weekly, and we, we follow that hashtag each week when we're putting the show together. Uh, subscribe to the show and all our shows on, on the iTunes store. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so using the Amazon affiliate link on our site. Um, it's right there on the, the right-hand side. It doesn't look any different to you. It doesn't charge you anything else, but we get a, a little commission, and that's, that's a nice thing for us. Um, next week, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our guest is Derek Brumel, and because of that, we're going to have a little bit later start than usual. So if you'd like to watch live, uh, we will be at soundnotion.tv slash live starting at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so do your own calculations for your local time zone. Uh, and we appreciate anyone who watches live, and we are always uh, watching the chat room. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week. Are you familiar with cat beards? Cat beards. No, oh, no, I'm not. You have to do a Google search for cat beards. <laughs> anyway, you just hold your cat up in front of your face. Yeah, or something? It, it involves holding your cat in front of your face to give yourself a beard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, before oh, our these are funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, screw sound notion. Let's just do cat. Beard. Let's look at this oh. is this week in cat beards. Uh, there we go. It's almost a cat beard. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> live live cat bearding on Sound Notion. <laughs> <laughs>